Hey folks, you're just in time to join me in watching something more cringy than any movie I've reviewed. And that is the first test run for Trivial Theater. So March marks the two year anniversary of my channel, and I wanted to kick off the month with something kind of special. I figured why not show you where I began. You'll definitely see traces of the content you know, but this was pre-Avatar, pre-Popcorn, and pre-actual theater. All there was was a sorta of quippy script, a few weird placeholders, and a chef's kiss of a bad movie. All of this eventually got honed down into my first episode, so come cringe along with me as I take you back to January of 2019. Every movie has random trivia, those interesting behind the scenes facts that help a movie become what it is. For better or worse. Come explore some of the more interesting ones with Trivial Theater. I've been a fan of movies since way back, and films that are considered obscure, random, or straight up bad are some of my favorites, because it's usually some random behind the scenes things that help lead them to the weird final products they become. Without further ado, this is the amazing bulk. Strap in kids, cause this one gets a little weird. If you can't tell by the title and cover art, this is pretty much a straight up ripoff of The Incredible Hulk. Although weirdly, this movie's journey started as an idea for a female Spider-Man type character called X-Spider. We open on a prostitute walking down a super realistic CGI street. She's murdered and we see a giant purple thing. The shot fades out in classic movie fashion to some intricately crafted titles. We return to the previous day in a super realistic CGI lab where our hero, Dr. Henry Hank Howards, works on a serum to increase human strength and agility. Original plot point, right? All he seems to achieve is exploding CGI rats in a cascade of blue sparks as We're dabbling in God's backyard. He finds himself under intensive deadlines from his military supervisor, who also happens to be the father of his lady love. The girl with a great personality and the great assets to match? Scientist guy intends to propose, but is shut down when he asks army dad for her hand in marriage. This shot is made all the weirder by a weirdly mentioned dust allergy. I hate dust. I don't want it building up in my home. The Wikipedia description actually includes this as a point of note with the proper term for a dust phobia, even though it serves no purpose other than for Army Dad to do his best impression of a podiatrist. We fade to Army Dad and Scientist Guy walking naturally down the world's largest wine cellar, where he gives a motivational speech for the ages. The government will stop funding this project unless you start showing some goddamn results. And until I see some, I sure as hell ain't gonna let you marry my daughter. Then it cuts to our lovely couple on the most realistic CGI roller coaster you've ever seen. It transitions seamlessly into a super realistic subway ride where scientist guy is robbed of the engagement ring, and then this terribly intensive fight breaks out. And then suddenly, we're transitioned into this amazing rendering of a beautiful sports car, where scientist guy and his lady love discuss the night's events. Frustrated, he goes back to the lab and angrily works on making CGI rats not explode, using a purple compound instead of a pink one, because obviously in science, color is everything. He finally turns a real dead plant back into a fake not dead plant. Of course, the next logical step in the scientific process is to inject himself with this HOLY SHIT THAT'S A BIG NEEDLE! The realistic CGI table shakes and for some reason a tornado breaks out. When it subsides, the amazingly detailed prop hand appears, leaving us in suspense as the shot fades. On a side note, the main character guy has the saddest, sad face I think I've ever seen. How does he do that? Like that actually takes conscious muscle control to keep your face that way for such long periods of time, right? So between all of this, we get a side villain B-plot that's as well fleshed out as the Rhino in The Amazing Spider-Man 2. Their well laid out scenes include this dance, This line of dialogue. Would you like something um hard? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> and this laugh. <laughs> we return to the opening shots and relive the prostitute being murdered, but this time a big purple blob attacks the gunman who also robbed the scientist guy the previous night. The cops investigate the crime scene and find Scientist Guy's wallet. Scientist Guy wakes up covered in goop and, after being questioned by the police, stealthily returns to the scene of the crime, only to be caught by the cops. All hell breaks loose and we get our first real reveal of the amazing bulk in his full… glory? Barney the purple dinosaur. Random side question, I've lived in the Midwest for quite a while and I've never seen a big purple blob monster come out of a tornado before. Have I been missing something or is this more of a recent phenomenon? 
we finally get to see Barney the Purple Blobosaur run, and it's as glorious as you'd expect. That is one fine caboose. And I'll tell you what, whoever was in charge of making sure that everything was kept at the correct size ratio knocked it out of the park. I bring this up because it's one of the few scenes that I actually liked in this movie. Turn that frown upside down, scientist guy is taken to a research facility and studied. He gets a plea bargain of sorts and goes to do Army Dad's dirty work, but is himself ambushed. He escapes and is chased down in arguably one of the greatest chase scenes ever put to film. We're talking as good as Bullet or the Blues Brothers. The bulk of course runs away from and or by no less than two lizards on laptops, two soccer players, Robin Hood, Daniel Boone, a cowboy, various birds and mammals, a bunch of playground equipment, a superhero dog, Zeus, air vehicles, water vehicles, land vehicles, and Rowdy's bar. All of this culminates in the greatest and most fakiest explosion ever set to film. But like most horror movies, the end is not the end. The thing about this movie, from beginning to end, is it's hard to tell if it's meant to be this fucking weird or not. The very first three scenes made it obvious that you shouldn't take it too seriously, and most of the movie goes on to give that same vibe, but there's just something about it that makes me unsure of the original intent. Listening to the movie's commentary, it's clear that they were never planning on making a super serious comic book film. The mockbuster moniker wasn't added until much later, so take that however you will. The commentary also repeats time and time again how they went the cheapest route possible because it was a quote unquote micro budget movie. I waited until now to address a giant purple naked monster in the room, the filming and backgrounds. So this was shot on green screen over the course of five or six days, and the backgrounds are stock, bought off a series of stock graphic and animation sites credited at the end of the movie. The weird variety of images, especially in the climactic chase scene at the end, leaves me scratching my head. In my research, I can't find anything that talks about why this decision was made. All I can assume is that he had a lot of random shit left over and was like, fuck it, throw it all in. The Amazing Bulk spent a year being edited, but was only released in 2012, meaning its dated CGI graphics look even more dated. The biggest takeaway I had was how this turned into a masterclass on how not to do green screen. This includes angles and perspectives that should be used in shots, and just straight up terrible green screen work. With the understanding that sometimes green screen isn't done under ideal circumstances, there are a lot of really strange moments, like these edges, and whatever the hell this is supposed to be. I get shit happens, but this is a little silly. In that same vein, the consistency of the graphics in this movie bugs the crap out of me. In one scene, they can range from goofy and badly drawn to decent illustrations. I'm not sure if the director didn't care about continuity or if he honestly couldn't find anything else to fit his vision, but this background, this dog, and that plant don't go together. Ah, This movie perplexes me so much! Another thing that stood out was the director's use of inconsistent ratios. And again, there are two sides to this. There are examples, like the comically large bulk foot stomping his enemies, and the helicopter being taken out by a 10-story bulk that are meant to be laugh-worthy. But there are so many poorly done shots, and that's the biggest chimp I've ever seen! Whether from shock or actual entertainment, when the lady cop is smashed by this smart car, I can't help but laugh my ass off. It's so fucking bad. Apparently I am perpetually 12 years old. So there you go, the incredible Barney the Purple Blobosaur. I mean, amazing bulk. The director talks about the influences of the movie, which includes Who Framed Roger Rabbit, various comic book movies, and a personal influencer of his, Stanley Kubrick. In fact, this shot right here is a direct homage to 2001 A Space Odyssey. On its most basic level, it's a movie you can turn off your brain and laugh. But you really have to turn it off. Like, call the electric company and have them physically disable the line. But there is something about this movie that just doesn't set right with me. Despite the chuckles and fascination with the visual effects of this movie, the feeling it ultimately leaves me with is comparable to watching an asylum movie. One of the more prolific companies behind Sci-Fi Channel's glut of cheaply made, so bad they're absolutely awful fantasy and sci-fi movies. On the DVD commentary, the director says they didn't have a choice but to go with green screen and cheap backgrounds because the budget was so small. The fact that he uses the term micro-budget as a crutch as to why it looks so cheap does not make up for the lackluster acting, terrible script, and not so great green screen work. That shit excuse does not sit well with me. Half-ass filmmaking is half-ass regardless of budget, and attitudes like that do no favors for those that work with low budgets and create amazing pieces of cinema. So what do you think? Any suggestions for movies? Any trivial questions? Comments, ratings, and terrible stock image backgrounds are appreciated. Thank you so much for tuning in.